Revelation. You guys ready to do some work on Revelation? I am excited about this series and intimidated by it at the same time. And here's why. Revelation is one of those books where you either love Revelation and you're passionate about it, or every time somebody says the name Revelation, you go, and you just don't want to have anything to do with it at all, right? And I got to figure out how to do this series. It's going to take us pretty much to Advent that'll keep you interested, all both camps. Uh, So good luck to us on that. Um, I'm I'm excited about it because I feel like it's, I mean, like since the writing of Revelation, since the writing of Revelation, this book has been debated on a lot of different levels. It's been debated all over the place. And so I hope that we can kind of demystify some of it for us and, and really, like the book of Revelation at, at, the, at the entry level is pretty simple to understand, it's also incredibly complex. And so anybody who says to you, I have the key that unlocks all the mysteries of Revelation, they are way too full of their own knowledge. Or, I mean, if it was really that simple, it wouldn't have been debated over the generations, right? So this is a book that we're going to answer some questions and we'll probably raise a bunch more questions. But here's the deal. I may or may not agree with your view of the rapture and the millennial reign of Christ and what it is and when it is and all this stuff. You are not allowed to leave our church over that. There's going to be a lot more way important things for you to leave the church over. That is not one of them, right? If, if you're like, well, but you thought... And, and here's the other thing. If anybody says to me, so... All the theologians of the history have all been wrong, and you figured it out. I will slap you. (laughs) No, that's not what I'm saying. I think that all the theologians of the world have had a phenomenal conversation going on for a couple thousand years about this book, and modern evangelicalism has thin sliced the conversation and said this was all of it. What I'm trying to do is invite us into the larger conversation that's been going on all along. And maybe in so doing, we will have some really enlightening moments with this incredible book. John is a literary artist. The, the, the what he does, it's, it's it, it, before, I'm not in the super passionate camp about, about Revelation. I have been in the, like, I've been in that world. I have never studied so much for one series before on any book of the Bible, including Leviticus, including Romans, including Hebrews. Like, I'm, the more I study, the more I am just, I, I'm falling in love with the book in ways that I didn't think I could. Now, don't worry, I'm not gonna, Russia, I mean, I'm not gonna go there, but we'll we'll talk about that. So let us begin with Revelation chapter 1 and verse 1. The revelation of Jesus Christ, you should probably underline that. If you're taking notes, you should probably underline that, and here's why. Because this book almost didn't make it into the canon. The canon is the books of the Bible that are the ones that are in the Bible. This book almost didn't make it in for two main reasons. Number one, because the people who canonized scripture thought that the book was too Jewish. It is. Now, we can say, well, we need to prove that it's not Jewish. Or we can say, no, actually, in fact, it is Jewish. And we need to understand it as such if we're going to actually get at what it really is talking about. Does that make sense? So the second reason that they said that it was not, didn't belong in the canon was because it didn't talk enough about the preeminency of Christ. About how, about his deity and about his kingdom and about him as a, it didn't talk enough about that. Well, the opening line is, it's his revelation. What? (laughs) Which God gave him to show to his servants the things that must soon, circle that, soon take place. 
How far off are we from when these things are going to actually happen? Soon. Okay, that's important. We'll talk about that. He made it known by sending his angel to his servant John, underline that, who bore witness to the word of God and to the testimony of Jesus Christ, even to all that he saw. Blessed is the one who reads aloud the words of this prophecy. Now, you're going to want to underline that because that's important. Uh, Blessed is the one who reads aloud the words of this prophecy. And blessed are those who hear and who keep what is written in it for the time is... This is important. This is important. Okay. Okay. John, to the seven churches that are in Asia, grace to you and peace. You should probably underline that. From him who is and who was and who is to come. And from the seven spirits who are before his throne and from Jesus Christ, the faithful witness, the firstborn of the dead and the ruler of the kings of the earth. How in the world is this not about the preeminence of Christ? That's nonsense. Here's one thing that they said, the early church fathers, as they were canonizing scripture, one of the things that they said was, well, it doesn't put Jesus in his proper place in Trinitarian thinking. It has God the Father, him who was and is and is to come. It has the spirits, and then it has Jesus as the faithful witness. How come he's at the end of the list? He should be in the middle. And there, Well, here's why, and this is not my theory. This is Ron Harms, Dr. Ron Harms, who's pretty smart. Um, Here's what he says. The reason is because John wants to leave us with this thought that Jesus is a faithful witness of everything that's gonna be written in this book. And that matters because what he's gonna appeal to again and again and again is hang in there. Jesus already went through this and the tomb is empty. That's his appeal. Listen to me. From the get-go of this book, we need to understand that John's appeal isn't heaven. It isn't, we win, so hang in there. It's, the tomb is empty so we can have peace. Which is mind-blowing in the world of apocalyptic literature, which we'll get to. Hang with me, hang with me. This, this is, we're going to throw a lot of really big terms at you that you're like, I don't know what you said. It's okay, most of it won't matter other than to show that we actually know what we're talking about, okay? To him who loves us and has freed us from our sins by his blood and made us a kingdom. Like, that ought to motivate you. You've been freed by Jesus. But this isn't about the preeminence of Christ. This probably doesn't belong in the Bible. Made us a kingdom, priest to his God and Father, to him be glory and dominion forever and ever. Amen. Is this not about the preeminence of Christ? From the beginning of the book, that's all it's about. Why? Because of the empty tomb. Not because daddy's going to come back one day and spank you. And this is how a lot of us read the book of Revelation is that, so I was the youngest kid in my family. There's three kids. My brother was the oldest and we had a sister in between us who was the toughest of all three of us without question. (laughs) My brother's six and a half years older than me and he used to pick on me mercilessly. And I would, nah, I'm over it. (laughs) I'm over it. (laughs) Years of therapy and some really good medication. No, I'm just joking. (laughs) So I used to like sit and seethe and just take it until my parents got home and then I would narc him out and he would get spanked. Justice. And I think that's how Christians read the book of Revelation. You just wait till dad gets home. You're going to get whooped. And we hang in there seething. Listen, our hope as a Christian doesn't rest in heaven. It rests in the empty tomb. Yes. It's already been done. And because of that, we have peace today. We don't have to just sit and... Right? The joy of the Lord is my strength. 
The work has been done. And because the work has been done, we have hope for tomorrow and for today. That's John's appeal. And it's important for us to frame the book of Revelation that way. Okay. So let's talk about this book. What is it and and what's the occasion? Now, this is going to be a little bit different of a sermon than normal. Uh, This is more like a Bible college class. This is like a history class. And it's important because we're going to lay a foundation upon which we can build the house. This week, really, and next week, we're going to take some, we're going to do some big 30,000 foot views of the book of Revelation. How should we approach the book as a book? And then... We'll go from there. Okay, so let's look at the, at the book as itself. First of all, the author. Who's the author of the book of Revelation? Well, it says it's John, right? John says he wrote it. Now the question is, who's John? For most of church history, John, the apostle of Jesus, has been considered the author of Revelation. And for our series, that is what I believe, That is what I hold to. Now, you need to understand that in view of modern scholarship, I am in the minority. Most of modern scholarship says that John the Apostle and John the Elder, who actually the book of Revelation calls him John the Elder, are not the same guy. I believe that they are. Okay, And I would suggest that the burden of proof is on one who would say anything different. Church history has led us to this place of John the Apostle. That doesn't mean that church history is always right. What that means is the burden of proof is on the one who bucks the system, not on the one who holds the line. Does that make sense? And sometimes the one who bucks the system is in fact right. And you have permission to do that as long as you can prove why you're doing it. But the burden of proof is on the one who wants to change the game. You with me? I believe that John the Apostle wrote the book of Revelation. And we're going to present this series as if that's true. Just understand that I'm in the minority on that in modern academic scholarship. Okay, so the occasion. When was it written? It was written. Now, this is, this is one where we get, this is lots of fun. There are people who will tell you that it was written as early as 60 A.D. 60 Six, zero, 60, not 1960, 60, like zero 60. Uh, there are people that will tell you it was written as late as 300 AD. This huge, like when was it written? When, what the, who, how? It depends on a lot of different variables. Here's what I'm gonna b- tell you, that for this series, this is what I believe, and this, it's not just what I believe for this series, it's what I believe to be true. Um, and so that's how we're gonna present this series. I believe that the book was written specifically during the second half of the reign of Emperor Domitian. Now Domitian reigned from September 14th of 81 until September 18th of 96 AD. Anno Domini. Let's say CE, Common Era. Okay? Why do I give you the day, the months and the days? Because those of you who care about Revelation care about these kind of details. Do you know what the day is? Yep. Yep, I do. I do. So we're gonna explain why that is, but I but I would date the writing of the book itself between 90 and 96 AD, somewhere in that window. And there's some really compelling evidence why I will stand there. Obviously, I'm compelled by it or I wouldn't believe it. Um, and so we'll talk about that, but this is a whole series. It's not one sermon, okay? So that's the occasion. Now, I want to give you the audience, and this is critical This is critical for us to get, okay? So let's throw up a map. This is the Roman Empire. The dark brown part is the Roman Empire, technically at the time of Hadrian, which is very close to what it was at the time of Domitian. It's it's a little bit bigger here, specifically in the north, but this is, by and large, the Roman Empire at the time of Domitian. The most powerful empire ever in the history of the world. The United States would bow to the Roman Empire in a second. And if you're like, no, we wouldn't, we're Merkins. (laughs) Yes, we would. (laughs) Yes, we would. Oh, and by the way, the Pax Romana, where they didn't have a war for 200 years, like our country's not even 300 years old. They didn't have a war for 200 years of their massive amounts of hundreds of years of ruling. And so not only were they bigger and more powerful, they did it for longer. So maybe we're not as awesome, but... 
This is the Roman Empire. And the reason why this matters is because there are some really interesting worldview divisions in the Roman Empire, because it's huge. And so if you draw a line between Greece and Asia Minor, to the west of that line is what we would call the Greek worldview. It's the Western worldview. To the east of that line is where what you would call the Eastern worldview. Really, Asia Minor becomes a melding pot of both influences. And it's really interesting because the book of Revelation, and this is important, the book of Revelation is not written to you. It's, not, it's written for you because of the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, and you can glean from it and learn from it, but it's not written to you. Does that make sense? It's written to first century Asia Minor under the Roman Empire control. And if that's true, then we've got to understand that. Now, please understand that this division is really critical because in Rome, on the western side, you have all these, this is true in history regardless of the empire, all these great military leaders, Alexander the Great and Julius Caesar, they come in and they conquer the world. They start in the West and move East. They leave the West as a great military leader. They come back from the East as a God. There's something about the Western power merging with the Eastern religious system that allows these people that are at the top to deify themselves. Now, The people in Rome, uh, Rome's here on the boot, the Italy boot, right? Rome's in the Italy boot, Rome in the self-proclaimed eternal city. Um, The people in Rome were like, you know, we really can't fight you at calling yourself a god because if we do, we'll die. But we ain't buying the whole emperor's a god thing. That's a joke. Have you seen these people? Look at the size of their noses, (laughs) right? Like, there's no way they're gods, No way. In the East, emperor worship became mainstay. And Asia Minor becomes the center of emperor worship. Is it any wonder that God who became man and dwelt amongst us and invited us to be a part of his kingdom moved his center out of Israel and into the center of man-God worship. Come on. It's almost like God knew what he was doing. But that's another sermon in the series. This is cool because what we have to understand then is what's going on in Asia Minor. Now, what I want to do is I want to zoom in on this section, this Asia Minor section right here. This is where, the, I mean, seriously, five of the 12 apostles land here. More than half of the New Testament that we have in our Bible was written here. When Constantine legalized Christianity, he put his capital here. This becomes the center of Christianity for 1,800 years, give or take. Like this, this is the action. The Hagia Sophia, which is the largest cathedral ever built, the they've got this dome, 132 feet in the air. It's 110 feet one way and 115 feet the other way, so it's not a perfect circle. Modern architects still cannot figure out how they did it. It's here. This becomes the place. And John writes his letter here to these people. And so these seven churches of Revelation, I want to show you these, Ephesus, Smyrna, Pergamum, Thyatira, Sardis, Philadelphia, and Laodicea, they're all here. Now, there's, there's a lot of speculation on why these seven churches. They're not the only seven churches that are in Asia Minor. There's lots of other churches in Asia Minor. Paul's first missionary journey is here. He starts churches in Antioch, Pisidia, Iconium, Lystra, and Derbe. He starts... Paul starts his second missionary, or his first missionary journey right down here in a little port called Italia. He skips Perga and goes up here to Antioch, Pisidia, Lystra, Iconium, and Derby, and then comes back down this way, gets back here, and goes back to 
Antioch, which is right over here. That's his first missionary journey. It all happened right there. By the way, come with me next year to Turkey. I'll take you. We'll go there. It's all still there. Like, this is where the action is. So why just these seven churches? Well, one theory is, and it's a good theory, John is the pastor of these seven churches. These are the seven churches that he pastors. And so he writes the letter to his seven churches. That's a good theory. Uh, one theory is these seven churches are, uh, become a representative cross-section of all the churches of Asia Minor. It's a good theory. It's a good theory. Maybe they become a cross-section of all the churches of all times. Maybe these seven issues that these seven churches are facing is the same seven issues that all churches will face. It's a good theory. It's a good theory. The other theory is, I don't know. It's a good theory. <laughs> it's as good as the other two, right? Uh, why these seven? I think my, my personal opinion, my opinion is these are probably the seven churches that John is connected to. And the reason is because of what we're going to talk about next. What is Revelation as a book? What is it? Well, Revelation as a book, first of all, it's a letter, right? Remember I asked you to underline grace and peace to you. This is a standard letter format. This is chapter one, verses four to six. So we should have a slide for that. Where is it? Where's our slide for that? That, we've, we've already been through that. Next, there it is. All right, there's our slide. We're gonna have to edit that out of the, whatever goes on the internet. It'll be a weird glitch. Uh, the rapture. Um, and Aaron's still here. <laughs> Left behind. I was left behind. <laughs> that's funny. I don't care who you are. That's funny. The church attendance went in half, but Aaron was still there. What? Okay. So the first, the first thing we have to understand about Revelation as a book is that it's a letter. It's written to a group of people that are familiar to the author, and that's important. This is like you writing an email or sending a letter to a friend. This isn't some big theologian trying to make some great, magnanimous, provocative point. This is, a, this is a pastor writing to people that he loves. And that's so important for us to catch. But secondly, what we also have to understand is that this is Christian prophecy. This book is prophecy. Remember, I said uh, to underline the, the verse that said, uh, to those who write this in, uh, or who read aloud the book, this prophecy, okay? So that's important because what we have to understand, not prophecy in the sense of predictive future, which by the way, the vast majority of biblical prophecy is not that. Biblical prophecy is way more about, listen, here's what's on the horizon. It's not about having any kind of special uh, be ability to predict the future, not Nostradamus. It's anybody who could look through a window can see what's coming. And this is what's coming. But it was written to be spoken by an orator, by a presenter. It was written to be read aloud, which is why it says, blessings on the one who reads this book of, prof of prophecy and blessings on those who hear it because it was meant to be read. And so it's this incredible story. It's this incredible story with these dragons and beasts and horses and wars and blood and pestilence. Ah, oh, it's cool. It's like, man, I want to I hear this story, right? It's written to be spoken. So maybe the way we ought to absorb Revelation isn't so much by reading it only, but by listening to it read aloud, because that's how it was intended to be presented. But there's a third thing, and this is really the part where everybody kind of camps on, so we'll live here for the most part. 
Revelation is apocalyptic. And the problem for apocalypse as a genre of literature rather than survivalist magazines is that we don't really have a modern equivalent for it. Okay? And so apocalypse is really hard for us to get a good frame of reference. And this is where it becomes difficult. So at one level, Revelation is incredibly simple, but it's actually, it's complicated. Anybody feeling that tension? Like it's simple, but it's, it's complicated. It deals almost exclusively with apocalyptic images and metaphors. In fact, a guy by the name of Rudolf Boltmann, who was a German scholar who had a really low view of Revelation in, honest, in all honesty, here's what he says. He says, Revelation is a weakly Christianized Jewish apocalyptic. Now, what we can do is we can try to fight that and prove him wrong. No, uh because you don't understand. Da, 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 da. Or we can go, you know what? He's probably right. And that ought to influence how we understand the book and what it's saying. Does it make sense? So that's important. Now, I'm not saying we should only study Jewish apocalyptic literature, but what we ought to do is be able to understand that that's going to influence what's written, okay? So then the question is, well, okay, if it's a Jewish apocalyptic, what's an apocalypse? Well, the Greek word is the word apocalypsis, apocalypse, apocalypus. <laughs> it's a story that uses icons, images, and symbols to communicate hope for today. A guy by the name of John Collins gave us this definition. Apocalypse is a genre of revelatory literature with a narrative framework in which a revelation is mediated by an otherworldly being to a human recipient, disclosing a transcendent reality by which is both a temporal and insofar as it envisages eschatological salvation and spatial insofar as it involves other, another supernatural world. Are you confused yet? <laughs> yeah. Really big words. <laughs> Here's what he said. An apocalypse is a story. So you have to understand that. It's a story. It's not meant to be understood literally. It's a story. And in the story, there's all these images and icons and metaphors that are used to explain where we're at today. And Traditional in apocalypse is that there's going to be this one cataclysmic event that's going to change the whole game. So it talks about hope for today, and that matters, because the apocalypse is not about some point in the future, it's about giving you hope for today, and that matters, because the first hearers and readers of this book did not get out their whiteboards and charts and graphs and try to figure out how it was going to end. I believe that the first readers of this wept. And in the moment, understood. And this is the key distinction between Revelation as an apocalyptic work and all other apocalyptics in the genre. For them, the moment of resolve was still coming. For John, it's already happened. Because of the empty tomb, you can have hope today. And yes, it's going to get bad. Yep, it is. It's bad. It's going to get worse. Yep, it's worse. Yep, it's going to get worse. But hang in there. Because guess what? Listen, that why does John begin with his vision in the throne room of God? Because I've been to the throne room. Hang in there because I've been to heaven and Domitian doesn't sit on the throne. Everything else that we're going to understand about Revelation has got to be understood there. And who's worthy to break open the seals? The one who conquered death. Come on, I weep every time I read Revelation for I can't, like I can't even think about it, I get weepy. I can't, I can't read it without like, I, I, who's worthy to open the scroll? And I looked and there was no one worthy. And then the angel came to me, right? Because this is what happens with apocalyptic literature. It's a, an otherworldly transcendent being that comes and delivers the message to a man. The angel came to me and said, don't fear, look. He's worthy. And I looked and I saw a lamb. 
His call is immediately back to the sacrifice of Jesus on the cross and the empty tomb that says, hey, take your best shot. I got this. And if Jesus can endure it, so can you hang in there. That's revelation. You know, good news, now we don't have to have a whole series on it. Where's John getting his material? We got to run. Where's John getting his material? Primarily, John is getting his material from Daniel, Ezekiel, and Jeremiah. This matters, and we're going to talk about this really next week, but this matters because John's not making this stuff up. All of the stuff that he's doing, all these images and metaphors and pictures, it's all already there. It all already exists. He's pulling on a body of information that he already understands. This isn't new. And that matters for you and I, and we'll talk more about this next week, but that matters for you and I because of this. Because I think one of the messages of Revelation is, hey, we've been here before. Don't freak out. Yeah, you're suffering that you don't want to endure. God, we've been here before. We've been here before. No, it's not awesome. It sucks. People are going to die. People are going to be butchered. People are going to be tortured in the name of Christ. Yeah, it's terrible. We've been here before. God's still on the throne. Hang in there. The tomb's empty so you can have hope. He's pulling on these images from people that have already been having this discussion, okay? Also, secondly, it's also coming from other Jewish apocalyptic writings, which are known as pseudepigrapha. They're not scripture. Pseudepigrapha means false name. These are people who wrote apocalyptic stories, but wrote under a false name. So like the book of Enoch, which is a Jewish apocalyptic work, is not written by a guy named Enoch. This is also a break from John and other apocalyptic works. What they do is they leverage the name to give authority to the writing. So this is, he's, he's going to pull out of some of these places, some of these documents, some of these other apocalypse that are not biblical, but he's going to use some of the images that come from them. Okay? Now, n- next thing. Some of it is coming from other Jewish literature from the Second Temple period. And if you're like, I don't know what that is, we'll never reference it again. I just want you to know so that if you want to do deeper study, this is some of the stuff that you can pull from. Also, and this is important, some of the material that John is getting is coming from already existing Greco-Roman myths. He's pulling out of the Roman culture. And that's interesting that not only is he a master of the biblical world and of his own home world, but he's a master of the world, the contemporary world that he lives in, and he marries these two together in a way that's beautiful. So he's using Greco-Roman myths. He's doing that. Now, next piece. I'm running as fast as I can. Stay awake. It's going to be... Um, this is, these are all foundation pieces that are going to be really critical for us to refer back to throughout this series, which is why I'm just making a seed it all in one bite. Okay, four camps, four camps of people who read the book of Revelation. There's four kind of types of people who read. Number one is the preterist. The preterist says that deals with the, the meaning rooted exclusively in the past, that the meaning of Revelation is only relevant to past events. Okay? That's the preterist understanding and reading of Revelation. Number two is the historist. Now, the historist says that the book of Revelation is divided into seven different segments, and each one of those segments designates one period of time, seven different periods of history. And each one of those seven periods of history is committed or understood or labeled by one of the seven churches in Revelation 2 and 3. Which you're like, eh, eh. That's not, I don't even... Okay, next one, futurist. The futurist says that the meaning of the book is found in applying the book to specific people and events in modern times, which is why every time Russia flares out, everybody pulls out their book of Revelation. This big empire from the East, the European Union and the new world order and the... Right, like, you have to understand this. The European Union wouldn't have scared anybody that was the first readers of this because that wasn't even East for them. That was the West. 
We read it as if the book was written to the United States, and it wasn't. Now, that doesn't mean we can't apply it. What it means is we've got to apply it rooted in what it meant for the people who first read it. Right? Every time there's an Eastern nation that does anything, we're like, oh, the beast. Who is it? You know, somebody has a big March 12th, 2012, right? Like some big date that we pick where it's all going to end. Uh, lastly is the idealist. The idealist focuses on timeless principles that are transferable to all people, all places, all times. Now the question is, which one's right? And I would say this, none and all. It's, it's complicated, <laughs> right? But here's the thing that I want to suggest. I don't think that any one camp has it all figured out. I think that they all have an angle and a perspective and an understanding that if we could come together and have a civil conversation rather than trying to discredit everybody else, maybe we could find some really cool truths in there. And that is our hope for this series. Now, we're gonna move towards the Lord's table this morning, sorry. Uh, we're gonna move towards the Lord's table and, and we're gonna take communion together. So if you're serving communion, go ahead and go back and grab that. If you're new with us, we have an open table because Revelation gives us an open table because it's all about the empty tomb and we'd love to have you celebrate it with us. So if you're willing, we'd love to have you take communion. But I want you to hold those elements till the end and we'll take it all together. And so while they're passing that out, I wanna work through some of our implications. Implications of the sermon. Number one, revelation can be complicated, but it is also very simple. And we're gonna to try to live in this tension of don't underestimate what it is, but don't overestimate it either. This is a book with powerful truths that understood correctly can be transformative for us today. Second implication, revelation is not to be avoided, nor is it a call to arms. And this is important because for a lot of people, they're like, I don't even want to, I don't even want to talk about, I don't even want to hear the name revelation. Like I wilt like a flower on a hot day, right? It's not to be avoided. Understand that every word of scripture is inspired by God. These are God's words to you. And if God wanted these words to be for you, then you need to wrestle with how you can apply them because God thought they were important. And if you're like, but they're not important, they're stupid. That's quite a thing to say to God. <laughs> it's not to be avoided, but it's also not a call to arms. It's not this, when you're dead, wait till your father gets home. It's not that. He's going to spank everybody. It's not that either. So we're going to have to live in that tension. What does this mean, Jesus coming back on a white horse and the he went, he, first time he came as a lamb and next time he's coming as a lion? And blah, 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 blah. No, the hope, the hope of Revelation isn't in heaven. It's not in judgment day. The hope of Revelation is in the empty tomb. We're going to keep going back there. Next one. Understanding what Revelation means for us today depends on understanding what it meant for the first readers. We're going to hang our entire series on that premise. We've got to understand it in its context in order to make it make sense for us. Make sense? If we can't do that, then we can't possibly believe that we'd have any angle on what it might actually mean for us. Last implication. This is a quote from John Collins. In Revelation, however, as in all early Christian writing, the crucial act of deliverance has already taken place in the death and the resurrection of Jesus. And how in the world do we tie that to communion? That was a joke. <laughs> Why do we take this every single week? It's because our hope doesn't lie in what lies ahead. Our hope lies in the fact that it's already done. It's finished. So you can have peace today. We don't have to just sit against the ropes like a boxer getting beat up and cover up and take it. It's not 
what happens from now until then. Oh, and there's going to be a day. And the clouds will roll back and the trumpets will sound and Jesus will return and it's gonna be awesome. And at the end of this series, you're gonna come up to me and go, I completely disagree with you on how you said it was gonna end. And at that day, I will on our way up to heaven, come over and put my arm around you and say, see, I told you I was right. (laughs) But that's what I hope for on that day. For today, my hope, my peace, my passion, my power for living is in the fact that the tomb is empty. And if we don't understand that, then none of the rest of this is going to make any sense.